This is Joel. Doing the fourth tape of the new Hawaiian series. This Hawaiian series, that we call the new Hawaiian series, is the footage of the work that began last year with the Honolulu closed class. Toward the end of that class, many of the students asked if I would not soon again give another class. And I said that at that moment, I wasn't sure that there ever would be another class because of the conviction that we had missed our way through not understanding the nature of prayer. I said that evening that since prayer is our conduct with the infinite source of our being, that which we call God, that which actually we can have no intellectual knowledge of, but for which we have used such terms as mind, life, truth, love, God, the infinite invisible, spirit. Since this God, then, is the source of our good, is the creative principle of this universe. Mind you, creative principle of this universe, the infinite, only creative principle of this universe, the creative principle of all that is. And since this creative principle operates from a standpoint of supreme intelligence and without beginning and without end, it becomes so necessary to know how to make contact or become one with it. That unless we learn the way, we cannot avail ourselves of the omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience of this that we call God. Now, prayer, sometimes called treatment, or communion is the avenue through which we make our conduct or find our oneness or realize God. And so I said that if there were another class, the subject of that class would be prayer. Prayer, the means of making contact, the means of becoming one with, the means of bringing into our individual experience the activity, the law, the substance, the supply, the harmony, the allness of that which we call God. Last year, we had a class in uh, Hawaii, which in our tape recordings is known as the first Honolulu closed class. And uh, the fact that these recordings not only have gone into the major cities of the United States and Canada, but that the demand for them seems to be increasing even after more than a year's time has elapsed. And in many cities, this class is being repeated over and over again. This alone should be evidence that something was touched in that class that is very important for us as students of spiritual wisdom to know, to understand, and to practice, to live. The first night of that class, it became evident that the subject was the infinite nature of God. And the second night, very quickly it developed, the infinite nature of our own being. And of course, you see, that if I and the Father are one, 
The infinite nature of God's being assures the infinite nature of my being and of yours. Now please remember, this infinite nature of my being is not dependent on the fact that I am a student of truth, nor that I either belong or do not belong to some metaphysical group or teaching. The fact of the infinite nature of my being is dependent solely on my relationship to God. And that relationship is oneness. One. O-N-E. One. We shall hear much more about that word one as uh, our work progresses here today. I must emphasize right here the fact that you must accept anything that is true of me as being true of you. Anything that is true of any individual, spiritually true, of any individual, sage, seer, or saint, as being true of me and of you. Since the relationship of God to its creation is a universal one, and uh, as the Master taught, I and the Father are one, you will remember that he was very careful to assure you that he was speaking of your Father and my Father. In other words, that he was revealing a spiritual truth, a universal truth. What then separated the demonstration of Christ Jesus from that of the Hebrew rabbis of his day. For what separated the demonstration of the Master from that of his listeners, his students, his disciples? The relationship was the same. I and the Father are one, and this means your Father and my Father. We are all one in this relationship, in Christ Jesus, in truth in spiritual reality. So, the difference in demonstration is the difference in realization. The Master realized his identity. He recognized his relationship with the Father. He recognized God as the source of his being. He recognized God as his life, bread, wine, water. He therefore recognized his substance or supply as infinite, his life as eternal, his health as perfect. Since all these had their source in the Father, and uh, by divine inheritance was the right, the privilege, the experience, the relationship of the Son. All that the Father hath is mine. All that I have is thine. The Master, in his complete recognition of this, was enabled to demonstrate it. The disciples, not quite so sure of this, not quite so uh, deep in the realization of this, Likewise demonstrated good healing power, supply, only not in the same degree as a master. And the only reason for the difference in degree was the difference in the degree of realization. This being true, and uh, may I ask you, do you feel that this is true that I'm saying? Do you have a, an inner awareness that you are listening to truth? Because the fact that you are listening to me and hearing with your ears will not make your demonstration and is not prayer. You see what I'm driving at. You see how I am trying to bring to your realization the fact that it will be your realization of this truth that constitutes prayer 
or contact with the infinite, not merely the hearing of it with your ears, you can relax in your seats. You can sit back. There is no need to strain your mind or your ears to hear what I'm saying. What you must do is note whether or not what I am saying reveals in you a response of agreement. Not whether your mind is saying, yes, that sounds reasonable, but whether something deep down within you, your heart, your consciousness, is responding with a, yes, yes, that is truth, this is truth. Yes, I realize that only in the realization of this am I one with the Father, not merely in reading it or hearing it. If within you something is giving you an assurance, a comforting assurance, that you are hearing truth, that is the degree of your realization of the nature of prayer. Because that's exactly what prayer is. It is an assurance of truth within us. It's never, prayer is never going to God for something. Prayer is never asking for something. Prayer is never desiring anything. Unless we can speak of the desire to know God, or the desire to feel God's presence, or the desire to become more keenly aware of God's presence. That may be a legitimate form of desire, but there is no other. Many times, our students, so steeped either in old theology or in uh, modern metaphysics, lapse into a belief that they can go to God for something. That they can go to God for companionship, supply, employment, health, healing, and thereby postpone their demonstration of harmony. Our writings, our infinite way writings, are so filled with the word as given to us by the Master, Christ Jesus that it is not necessary for me to take up time at this moment repeating to you all that the Master has revealed about the nature of prayer. But one thing I uh, can remind you of, and that is that it will do you no good to take thought for your life, for your health, for your supply. That it will do you no good to go to God with a request or a desire. To begin with, God possesses nothing that it is withholding. God is withholding nothing that it possesses. God is infinite active being. All that God is and all that God has is flowing constantly into manifestation, into expression, into form. And to think that prayer will influence God to speed it up or to deliver it to your doorstep is foolishness that even some of the uh, so-called pagan tribes have learned uh, to regard with a smile. No, no, you can uh, bring harmony into your experience quickly if you can agree that there is no use in going to God for anything. If you can agree with the Master. Now when I say agree, please remember, I'm talking now about feeling an assurance of agreement within you. Not just saying, yes, I believe, yes, I agree with the Master, or yes, I'm a Christian, I accept his teaching. That amounts to less than nothing. Can you feel the rightness of what I'm saying? Can you feel the rightness of the Master's tremendous revelation that your Heavenly Father knoweth? that you have need of these things, and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Can you feel the rightness of that? If you can't, then uh, for a long, long while to come, do not go to God for anything, but work with yourself. Pray within your own being. Commune inside until you do come to a feeling, an awareness, an agreement that the Master 
is true. The master really do. Let the father know it, that you have need of these things, and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom long before you ask. You see, prayer is a recognition of this truth, of God's love for its own creation. It is uh, the inner feeling that the Father never has forsaken his creation. Ah, yes. You heard that, did you? I saw, I saw your ears go up. I saw your heads come up that time. And I know just what you meant. The Father knows our need before we do. And it is his good pleasure to give it to us. Why, Joel, just look around and see all of the sin, the disease, death, calamities in this world. That's what you were thinking. But again, you forgot the wisdom of the great master. Judge not after appearances, judge righteous judgment. Have you been seeing with your eyes and hearing with your ears when really you shouldn't have been doing that? You should have been seeing with your eyes and hearing with your ears. Yes, that inner set of eyes, that inner set of ears, that spiritual awareness that does not judge by appearances, but judges spiritual judgment. Then you would have known that all of the sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, bad government that is in the world today comes only from one reason and comes only to those who are living through material sense, those still desiring, those still wanting to get, those who do not yet know the infinite nature of their own being and uh, that because of the infinite nature of their own being, they must let pour out from them, not try to add more to them. Certainly, the ordinary sense of prayer, orthodox or metaphysical, must fail because it is an attempt in most cases to add something to you, that you may achieve something, accomplish something, receive something, when uh, the infinite nature of your own being as uh, one with God means that your vessel is already full. All that the Father hath is already yours. How are you going to succeed in adding more to that? Oh no. Our poet friend Browning gave you the great secret when he said the truth is within ourselves and we must open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape, not try to add more to us. Now, in the judging by appearances, you come to a phase of belief that causes the entire trouble of human existence. And that is, you come to a judgment of good and evil. This you say is good and this you say is evil. Of course, the very thing you are calling good today may by a change of tradition or society, be evil tomorrow, and some of those things that are very evil today will be commonplace and normal and natural tomorrow. But you're not thinking of that at this moment in judging by appearances. You are judging by the present standard of society or the present traditions that have been handed down to us, and instantly you label a thing good or bad, based entirely on human opinion, human belief, human theory. May I say this to you, that as long as you are looking out upon this world through human eyes, you will always be seeing that which is good and that which is evil, even though you may change the classifications with each changing generation. You 
in order to rightly understand the subject of prayer, must begin with this instant to give up human judgment as to good and evil, so that when you are faced with persons you deprive yourself of the pleasure of being a good psychologist. You give up your human wisdom and uh, you do not judge that this one is honest and this dishonest, this one good and this one not to be trusted and uh, this one so and this one so. No, you have to give up your human sense of gratification at your psychological wisdom. And you have to learn to look at all those you meet without judgment, without putting upon them an opinion of good or evil. And naturally, this you're going to find very, very difficult. Of course, easy in comparison to what you're going to have to do later. For it probably would be well to become proficient first in learning to meet people in your family, in your community, in your church or center, in your business, and withdraw your opinion of good or evil, intelligent or stupid, good or bad, moral or immoral, honest or dishonest, and look at each individual with no condemnation, no criticism, no judgment, no opinion, but only with the realization that God is. God is, life is, at all. You are permitted no further judgment on any person than that. God is, life is. Ah, yes, I know. It's a matter of training. It is so easy and uh, so satisfying to one's ego to be a good judge of human nature, to be able to humanly evaluate those you meet. And of course, your opinion humanly may be right. You may be a good psychologist and you may know them exactly as they are, surely. But I can assure you that that knowledge will get you into trouble. It is getting all of the psychologists and psychiatrists into trouble. It is getting all governments into trouble. Looking out at this world and judging mankind and putting labels on them and then abiding by that human opinion or decision. There is but one way for you to come out from among them and be separate. And that is in your agreement that God made all that was made, and all that God made is good. In your agreement that invisibly God, the Spirit, is the life and the soul and the mind of individual being. How fantastic to accept a teaching revealing God as the life of all being, revealing God as the creative principle of all being, and then to begin to call some of it good and some of it bad. Are you beginning now to catch a glimpse of what is in my mind? Prayer is a feeling. Prayer is an inner sense of rightness. Prayer is your ability to be listening to me at this moment and saying, well, yes, how dare I judge a man? How dare I put a label on men? Why, the woman taken in adultery was not labeled by the master. He said, where is thine accuser? Neither do I condemn thee. To the thief on the cross, this night I will take you into paradise. To the man born blind, probably of syphilitic parents, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. 
who made me a divider of you. Do you follow this? Do you feel the rightness of giving up all censure, all judgment, all condemnation based on appearances? Do you feel within you the rightness of relaxing and saying, how dare I? How dare I sit in judgment on my fellow man? Why, the basis of every teaching, every teaching that we know of dating from 1500 B.C. is love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Now, prayer is your contact with God. And you have no contact with God unless you feel the rightness of loving your neighbor as yourself. And to love your neighbor as yourself is to drop judgment, criticism, condemnation. Yes, I know. I'm well aware of the fact that this is going to deprive you of a lot of your political discussions, even uh, church discussions and uh, true-centered discussions, because now you're not going to be able to fill in time by blaming the depression on Mr. Hoover or blaming the present conditions on Mr. Roosevelt or Mr. Truman. They're going to have to find a substitute for criticizing the members of your family, of your church groups, of your business associations. And this, I assure you, isn't easy. It calls for discipline. And it calls for something more. It calls for a deep, deep love of God. Be assured, no one can come into the holy atmosphere of God voicing criticism, judgment, condemnation on his fellow man. I hope you will look up that passage in Scripture in the New Testament about coming to the altar to pray and there remembering that any man has ought against thee and reminding you first go and make peace then come back to the altar you see while there is this human labels of good and evil there is no spiritual demonstration here now is the principle and the secret of spiritual demonstration when you look at a person with no opinion, no judgment, no label, not even good one, with just the realization God is, you set up a sort of a vacuum within you because of withholding human thought. And then into that vacuum rushes the spiritual wisdom defining that which is before you. In other words, giving to you the spiritual evaluation of the person. You will find that to be entirely different than your human estimate. Let us look at our neighbor and uh, with no human opinion, no human label, no human judgment, just with the realization why God is. God is the center of being. God is the allness of being. God is. Then watch as into your consciousness there comes a warmth. There comes a feeling of love for this person before you. It makes no difference if the human sense it is a relative or friend or enemy. The spiritual revelation shows you 
his or her true being as against the human seeming. If you successfully accomplish the ability to look at those who make up your world in this manner and uh, find the spiritual truth about them revealing itself to you, you will be ready for the next step and uh, the one that makes you a healer, a savior, a reformer, a supplier in your universe. Now comes the time when you must look at every condition. It may be imprisonment. Imprisonment in a prison. It may be imprisonment in a sick body. It may be imprisonment in lack or limitation. Whatever it is, you must look at that very condition and withdraw the terms good or evil. You must withdraw the human opinion good or evil. You must be able to look at every situation with the thought God is. I believe it is in uh, the book The Infinite Way that I said it takes a high degree of spiritual realization or spiritual consciousness to be able to look a serious disease in the face and uh, behold the Christ. I repeat that to you now. I do not ask you to look at a disease, a sin, imprisonment, or poverty, and say it is good. No, no, no. I do not ask you to make affirmations about it and say it is spiritual or it is harmonious. No, no, no. Not any more than I say to you, look at it and call it evil and desire to rise above it or improve it or heal it. No. Look at it without any thought of its being evil and without any thought of its being good and realize God is. God is only God is. God alone is. And withhold your human judgment. At this point you are wondering about the principle involved. What is the principle involved? Well, if you acknowledge God as infinite, can you acknowledge a sick or sinful person or a sickly condition, a diseased condition? No, the answer is very clear, you can't. Well then, uh, can you accept any person or condition as requiring healing, changing, improving, or removing? No, you cannot. Then what happens when uh, you witness what human sense would call error and label it error and then sit down to pray or treat for its removal? Well, there's only one answer to that, failure. Failure. Now remember, I do not ask you to look at an erroneous person or condition and call them good or spiritual or say that they are the Son of God. I ask you to give up all opinion, theory, belief, withhold judgment, do not declare anyone or anything good. Why callest thou me good? There is but one good, the Father in heaven. Call no one good and call no condition good, but call no one evil and call nothing evil. Learn to look at every person and situation with just two words, God is or up. It is, 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 not will be, not to be healed, improved, removed, no, no, God is, harmony is, it is, it is, it is, is, is the word, is now, then you will find that into that vacuum you have created by giving up human belief or opinion the Spirit will rush to define for you that which you are beholding and to reveal it to you in its spiritual entity and perfection. 
you will then not see human badness turned to goodness. You will not see human poverty turned to riches. You will not see human disease turned to human health. You will not see human guilt turned to human virtue. What? You will perceive the Spirit of God. You will perceive the activity and the law of God right where there had seemed to be a good or bad human person or a good or bad condition. You probably have studied well the chapter, The New Horizon, in the Infinite Way. And either you have understood or perhaps you have not yet understood why that chapter makes it so clear that we are not seeking to change bad humanhood into good humanhood. But in any event, now is the time for your realization that the object of our work and study in uh, The Infinite Way is the attaining of that mind which was in Christ Jesus, that is, attaining that same state of spiritual consciousness, or some degree of it, that was in Christ Jesus, so that we may behold the spiritual world, the spiritual man, the Son of God. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It is a spiritual universe governed by spiritual law. It is... Uh, a spiritual substance that never began and will never end. You can better understand that if you stop to think that there never has been a time when two times two weren't four. There never was a time when a rose seed would produce anything other than a rose or a pineapple seed, anything other than a pineapple, or an orchid, anything other than an orchid. In other words, the law of like begetting like has always been in effect. Before time began, no one started it. No one will ever stop it. And praying in the ordinary sense will not bring it about. All good already is. Even in the depth of the depression, the world was full of crops. The oceans were full of fish. The air was full of birds. God had no power to increase his supply. It was already infinite. It was more than the earth could use. It still is, in spite of these uh, seeming lax and high prices, for which there is no excuse, except, of course, the ignorance of our officials. There is no excuse for these high prices when uh, the world is growing more products and more produce than all of us can consume. Now, would prayer to God for increased supply actually increase the amount of fish in the sea or birds in the air? And would it be good if it did? No. There is already sufficient for everyone. The question is, how do we avail ourselves of it? And the answer is through prayer. And what is prayer? This feeling of agreement within you that some of you must be feeling now that these words are true. God is. God is. Would you change that? Would you change anything that God has made? Would you ask for improvement in God's universe? Would you ask God to let you influence the laws, the substance, the activity of God's own creation? No. No, come into agreement. Come into agreement. Well, perhaps I shouldn't have said that. You can't come into agreement unless you feel the agreement at this very moment. If you can't feel it now, you have difficulty in bringing yourself to it because hypnotizing yourself or affirming yourself into it is going to do no good. Right now, as you hear these words, this must be more than a message that you are hearing. This must be an inner agreement taking place within you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art. Thou art. God is. Is there any more than that to pray for? 
God is. The feeling of rightness of that statement, God is, is your prayer. In time, that very feeling would lead you into deeper and deeper and deeper realms of prayer, deeper planes of consciousness. But right now, it would be enough if you could drop all desire, all wishes, all hopes, ah, yes, even hopes, drop even your hopes in this agreement where God is. Isn't that enough? God is. But be sure of this. Do not judge after appearances. Look at any person, any thing, any situation, any condition, with just the realization that God is, and then let, let the spiritual appearance be made visible to you by the Father within you. This is Joel continuing on the subject of, uh, shall we say, God is or just is, the isness of being. All being is. Nothing can be added to infinite being. Well, do you remember when the Master was asked about the commandments? And out of the Ten Commandments, he selected one, the First Commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before me. God, God, God. Thou shalt have no other God. What is God? As far as God can be explained, we think of God as power. And so the commandment is, thou shalt have no other power than God. That is, thou shalt not acknowledge that anything but God is power. Can you imagine if you could accept God as the only power what a change would come into your life. I'll go along with you on that and confess that if I could uh, accept God wholly and completely, if I could realize God wholly and completely as the only power on earth, that my life would be transformed also. God as the only power. I say, what are we fearing? Germs? Infection? Contagion? God is the only power. What difference now if there is infection, contagion, germs? Since with God uh, being the only power would these other things have any power? According to the Master, they would have no power except such power as was given them by God. Have you ever thought of uh, germs, infection, contagion as being imbued only with qualities and activities of God? But what else could uh, that mean? Have no other power but God. Do we see a lack or limitation? How could lack or limitation affect us if God were the only power? Do we fear wars? Now, there is really a belief of power, isn't there? Bullets, bombs, bombs bursting in the air, they sing. 
the atomic bomb is bursting in hell. But according to the first commandment, only God is power. What would happen to the power of an atomic bomb if we could realize God as the only power? Think on that pretty deeply. Because there must come a moment of transition when uh, we intellectually declare, well, that's right. If God is the only power, what are we to fear from all the so-called powers of uh, earth and hell? There must be a moment of transition when we go from that intellectual agreement to that place of spiritual agreement that I spoke of on the other side of this recording. The place where a feeling takes place within you of agreement. Well, yes, that is the truth. The only I feel the truth of that one power. Thou shalt have no other God. God, we are told, is law. That is a very astonishing statement. God is the only law. Because now I am going to face you with a startling statement. At least startling to me. It's a question. Is there a law of disease? Is there? Is there a law of disease? Thou shalt have no other law but God. Is there a law of disease? Then what is perpetuating disease? What is continuing disease? What is causing disease if there is no law of disease? Of course, we're told, in accordance with your faith, so be it unto you. Therefore, if you have faith in uh, a law of disease, so it must be unto you. If you have belief, confidence that there is a law of disease, so it must be unto you. But can you at this moment begin to feel somewhere deep down within you, not upstairs in your head, but can you somewhere deep down within you begin to feel an agreement, a feeling of God as the only law, the only being, the only cause, you see, the world is trying to remove disease through the study of the laws of disease. And there are no such laws. Right now I'm going to tell you a story written by Khalil Gibran. I don't think it's a funny story. But it has its sides. The story is of a priest walking along the country road and hearing a man cry out for help. There he sees a man in the ditch, in pain, dirty, bleeding. And his first temptation is, of course, to go and help the man and then fearing that the man may be a criminal, or they may be dying and uh, that he might be blamed for the death, he decides to walk on and ignore the man. But the man cries out again for help, cries out desperately in his hurt. And the priest turns back again to help, but this time fears that the man may be an escaped uh, lunatic, and uh, fearing him decides to walk on. When the man again cries out for help, that he's wounded, bleeding, dying, dying, dying. He's afraid of death. He's afraid of dying. And the priest turns back and uh, this time decides to help the man. But the man's face seems familiar, even though not in a very nice way. And the priest voices that thought, haven't I met you? Don't I know you? And the man says, why, yes, I'm your best friend best friend? I, I don't recognize you. Well, yes, I'm your best friend. I'm the devil. Oh, the priest then goes on at a great rate, berating the devil and uh, 
asking only for the devil's death and wanting the devil's death, but the devil says, oh no, hold on. I'm your best friend. How would you make a living if I weren't alive? How do you get your pennies from the people except saying prayers to protect them against me? How does your church survive? How do they get money for these edifices except to overcome me? But supposing I were dead, what would you do then? And the story goes on that the priest took the man to his home and nursed him back to health again. That sounds strange, doesn't it? What would the church do if there weren't a devil? What need would there be of a church? Well, you know, when I read this story, the thought came to me, what need would there be of practitioners, metaphysical, spiritual practitioners, or teachers, if you could believe that God is the only power and the only law, and there is no power in sin, no power in disease, and no law of disease, nothing to cause it, nothing to perpetuate it. I thought perhaps I too would have to go back to work for a living, but I'm willing. I am perfectly willing to give up my ministry and uh, go back to selling uh, merchandise on the road if only I could be assured that we, all of us, could from this moment on learn that we must never fear the devil because he has no existence, never fear the power of a disease because it has no law, no power whatsoever, according to the Master's teaching and the teaching of all spiritual wisdom, remember. Only one power, only one law, only one being. Think, because this is the point that I am leading up to. Think. There is nothing in all this world to pray for or against. There is nothing in all this world to use God power against. Since there is no devil, there is no power apart from God. There is no law apart from God. There is no law of sin, no law of disease. So no longer do we have to turn to God to overcome these, to help us rise above them, to destroy them or remove them. That is the function of this teaching that I'm giving you today. This teaching which uh, we may call is. Just the two letters, I-S, is just as simple as our previous teaching, that which brought the infinite way into existence. Also a two-letter word, A-S, as. God expressed, manifest, as you and as me. God appearing as your being and my being. God appearing as. God manifest as this universe. No selfhood apart from God, since God appears as this universe. No condition apart from God, since God appears as the substance and activity of this universe. God appearing as. Doesn't that logically lead up to this? God is. And is, is all there is. And this is has neither good nor evil. This is uh, has no point of comparison, since it always, eternally, immortally, is what it is, and that is, is spirit. It isn't some degree of human good, nor is it some degree of human evil. It just is spiritually, harmoniously, joyously, eternally, infinitely, immortally, is. Is. Now just think. Law is. But not good law or bad law. No. The only law which we call God. God is. Power is. Not good power. Not strong power. Not bad power. Not evil power. Just power. One power. That's all there is. Thou shalt have no other God. No other power. There's only one power. That power is. It doesn't oppose anything. No use praying to it to overcome your enemy. No use praying to it to overcome sin or sinful desires or appetites. No use praying to it to overcome disease. Since there is only one power and the power that is, uh, is God. You see, the state of consciousness that we must be coming to now, after these years of the study of the infinite way, the state of consciousness to which we must be coming is a state of consciousness called is. 
resting in that is. It is. Think of the dilemma of the church without a devil to preach against, to oppose, to protect from. And now think of uh, 